So modernism spans a huge variety of artists and kinds of art from about 1860 to 1960. Um, and modernism, as we've been talking about, really broke away from convention and tradition and sought to modernize art to match the modern world. Modernists were, you know, trying to emphasize originality and innovation. Um, and really, modernism is based on idealism and universal principles. Modern art often adopts industrial materials and machine aesthetics, clean lines, cohesive forms, etc. But it also tends to shy away from utility and instead adopt an art for art's sake stance. However, in the mid-1960s, uh, sort of between abstract expressionism and, and pop art, kind of, we really start to see this shift away from the idealism and universalism of modernism towards postmodernism, uh, sort of a shift towards post-industrial capitalist society living in an age of mass communication that really required tolerance for difference and rapid change. So this shift kind of begins in the 1960s, but the term postmodernism was actually popularized in the 1970s, and then the movement really develops throughout the 1970s through the 90s. Um, postmodernism emphasizes individual experience, acknowledging that truth, knowledge, morality, all of this exists in relation to culture, society, and context. It's really grounded in pluralism, this sort of recognition that there is no one right way of doing things, no universal style or theory. Many postmodern artists continued to question the very nature of the definition of art and to break down the hierarchies of high and low art. They argued originality was unachievable in a world so overloaded with imagery. They really embraced appropriation, borrowing existing imagery directly from mass visual culture, recycling it into new contexts to twist or complicate its meaning, to deconstruct modernist ideas about originality, artistic identity, and authority, and to expose how consumer culture and the mass media constantly bombard us with images of lifestyles that are ultimately impossible to obtain. The term postmodernism was first widely used in discussions of architecture. Critic Charles Jinks used the term to describe buildings that moved away from the rationality, minimalism, and lack of ornamentation that had defined the international style and modernist architecture. Postmodern architecture rejected the modernist mantra of form follows function and instead chose elements for their symbolic meaning. Architects mined the past and other cultures for inspiration, mixing elements from different times and places in eclectic and playful ways, often incorporating references to contemporary pop culture as well. Philadelphia architect Robert Venturi was a pioneer in rejecting the abstract purity of the international style, and he incorporated elements from vernacular sources into his designs, applying decoration to his buildings, and ultimately challenging the modernist emphasis on uniformity, purity, and abstraction. Venturi famously parodied Mies van der Rohe's dictum, less is more, with his own, less is a bore. He advocated for architecture that embraced eclecticism and addressed the complex, contradictory, and heterogeneous nature of modern cities. Venturi's Vanna Venturi House, designed for his mother, exemplifies his architectural philosophy and serves as a prime example of postmodernist architecture. The facade returns to the traditional western house shape that modernist architects had rejected, and the design features a playful asymmetry with triangles and squares arranged in ways that skew the harmonies of modernist design. The house includes purely decorative elements, such as curved moldings, that were forbidden in the international style, and it consists of this sort of eclectic um, combination of um, architectural styles and elements from various um, historical periods. 
Um, the interior is also quite complex and contradictory with an irregular floor plan that you can see kind of in that drawing on the previous slide. Um, but it has this odd stairway that sort of um, wraps up and around the chimney of the fireplace here. And then um, irregular ceiling levels. And then on the second floor, this partial barrel vault as well. Um, here's another great example of postmodern architecture, this time by American architect Charles Moore, who really sought to design inclusive architecture that anyone could enjoy. This is his Piazza d'Italia, an urban public plaza and fountain in New Orleans constructed as a monument to the city's Italian citizens. The piazza is a theatrical combination of mismatched references to historical styles and contemporary vernacular architecture. There are references to historic Italian architecture, but the elements are combined in historically inaccurate ways. For example, the five concentric colonnades or rows of columns, um, they're made with modern materials, including concrete and stainless steel, and then they've been painted in these sort of bright colors, yellow, ochre, and red. Um, but more kind of brings together five different classical orders, mismatching different historical periods into one structure. Um, and then it's a little bit hard to tell in the photo, but neon lights also trim the structure and kind of illuminate and animate it at nighttime. One prominent postmodern artist is Jeff Koons. Um, He's sometimes labeled as a neo-pop artist because he really makes the relationship between art and commerce explicitly clear within his works. He embraced the ambiguity of pop art to both elevate and critique everyday subjects. In the 1980s, he started appropriating consumer goods and kitsch objects considered to be in poor taste because of their excessive garishness or sentimentality. He exhibited things like basketballs and vacuum cleaners in plexiglass display cases, and he hired skilled craftspeople to replicate lowbrow, mass-produced, imitative or decorative things like balloon animals, um, figurines, tourists by, etc. Except he makes them, or has them made, I guess, in an absurdly large scale using high-quality materials. So his sculptures are based on pop culture, and they sort of satirize consumer culture and high art, but they're also intended as sort of lavish, expensive luxury items for the wealthy. The effect is to place the object's artistic status directly alongside its commercial value and underscore its dual role as both economic and cultural commodity. So for example, we have Jeff Koons' 1988 Pink Panther here. Um, it's a roughly life-sized figure made of porcelain, colored in sickly sweet candy-like colors of pink, aqua, and yellow. It's maybe a little bit uh, similar or kind of recalls Andy Warhol's Maryland diptych and its attention to celebrity culture, but in an even sort of kitschier way. Coons modeled the um, partially nude female figure here on the 1950s film star and sex symbol Jane Mansfield. And she's sort of striking a pose while cuddling the very popular Pink Panther cartoon character from the 1963 film. The garish color and the slick texture really imply this cheap artificial beauty. And it's somehow both celebratory and critical. Postmodern theorists propose the relativity of knowledge, maintaining that there is no one truth or point of view. They accepted inconsistency, ambiguity, and uncertainty as characteristic of knowledge. Postmodernists maintained that the meaning of any snippet of knowledge is never fixed. When many dissimilar fragments are decontextualized, that is, taken from their original context and recombined into a pastiche or an imitation and combination of different styles, the potential cross-references and interpretations multiply in dizzying, unresolvable ways. Often, this occurs within an attitude of parody and irony. Sigmar Polk, a German painter and multimedia artist, worked in a postmodernist vein before the term was used. By the early 1970s, he was shifting styles and media from work to work, also combining references to high and low culture within a single work. 
His painting, Alice in Wonderland, serves as a point of intersection for an odd array of juxtaposed and superimposed art historical, literary, and everyday references. The canvas is a patchwork that includes fabric panels on either side, commercially printed with an aerial view of soccer players on a field. White polka dots are printed on black for the middle section, and white polka dots on blue run across the bottom edge. Polk painted ghostly images over the busy patterns. Over the right panel, he painted a volleyball player from a sports magazine, and over the left and middle sections, he sketched Sir John Tenniel's 1865 illustration in author Lewis Carroll's book of Alice, meeting a hookah-smoking caterpillar atop a mushroom. Polk may have been alluding to his experimentation with hallucinogenic drugs such as LSD during this period, but otherwise there is no coherent meaning for the combination of images of popular sports, the 19th century illustration, and polka dots, although the latter may be a somewhat playful reference to his own surname. Although postmodernism favored pluralism and difference, unfortunately progress was limited, opportunities remained few, and fundamental power structures remained intact, including art markets, galleries, museums, publications, and other institutions that judged and promoted professional artists. For some, postmodernism's challenge to the status quo seemed like an attack on Western culture's most fundamental values. In the art world, conflicts raged over freedom of speech and public funding for the arts, particularly with the regard to the right to make art that might be considered offensive to others, um, or works of art created for public spaces, because there's no universal agreement on which events or people should be commemorated or which forms art should take. For example, one of the most controversial public installations is the Vietnam Veterans Memorial on the National Mall in Washington, D.C., designed by Maya Lin, a 21-year-old student at Yale at the time, whose design was selected out of 1,100 entries for the commission. Lynn had proposed a simple, dramatic memorial cut into the ground in a V-shape, like a scar, as a symbol of a national healing over the divisive war. The memorial sits between the Washington Monument and the Lincoln Memorial, pointing to each. It consists of slabs of polished black granite, each 247 feet long, and they meet at a 130 degree angle, where they are about 10 feet tall. The change in scale enhances the viewer's experience as the sculpture seems to grow in height, overcoming and dwarfing the viewer as they progress down the lengthy plane. The slabs themselves are inscribed with the names of 58,272 American soldiers who were killed or who went missing in action during the Vietnam War, listed chronologically from 1956 to 1968. The memorial serves to commemorate the dead and missing, but also to provide a place for survivors to confront their own loss. Maya Lin employed polished black granite, the kind commonly used for tombstones, that reflects the faces of the visitors as they read the names. The effect is both to humanize the written words and to implicate the viewer who now bears witness to the national tragedy of war. Lynn purposefully tried to take an apolitical approach to make the work be about those who had sacrificed and not question whether the war was shameful or honorable, but the politics of the time weren't completely unavoidable. For example, the best black granite, at least at this time, came from Canada or Sweden, both of which were countries that draft dodgers had commonly fled to, so it was quite difficult for Maya Lynn to import the material that she wanted. Now, at the time of its completion, Myelin's design was strongly contested and critiqued. One opponent said, One needs no artistic education to see this memorial for what it is, a black scar and a hole hidden as if out of shame. Some argued the stone should have been white instead of black, and that her use of abstraction um, was sort of seen as this departure from the representational monuments that were traditionally used to honor war heroes. 
1983, in response to this criticism, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund commissioned another artist, Frederick Hart, to create a more naturalistic memorial depicting three soldiers, and this was placed about 120 feet away from Maya Lin's memorial. Then in 1993, another sculpture of three nurses by Glenda Goodacre was added about 300 feet to the south to really commemorate the contributions of women during the war. And then a flagpole was also added uh, sometime during this time. Now, Maya Lin was really opposed to these additions, but she was ultimately overruled. And so I think this example, as well as that of Richard Serra's Tilted Ark and even um, Serrano's Piss Christ, these kind of raise important questions about the rights and responsibilities of artists, as well as the obligations or responsibilities of those who fund, commission, and exhibit works of art. So again, postmodernism is really rooted in the idea of pluralism or multiplicity, and it acknowledges that there is no singular right way of doing or being. During the era of socio-political unrest and activism that occurred between the 1960s and 90s, postmodern artists became increasingly concerned with highlighting and exploring social issues and a multiplicity of ethnicities, genders, and sexualities. Um, they looked at who had been included in the canon and who had not, and they were thinking about how to rectify that and how to address the social issues and concerns of of a multicultural world. Certainly the art of the civil rights movement of the 1960s and 70s and the women's liberation movement of the 1970s were in this direction as they were trying to open up the canon that had been dominated by white men. Um, but individuals who had once stayed on the edges of society and the art establishment, um, be that by choice or through force, really began to claim center stage by making work that confronted issues of identity and unequal treatment based on gender, sexual orientation, race, class, and more. Their works not only challenged stereotypes and societal norms, but also served as powerful commentaries on the struggles and experiences of marginalized communities. Through their art, these artists gave voice to those who had been historically silenced, using their creativity to foster awareness, provoke thought, and inspire change. So the women's liberation movement of the 1960s and 70s really paralleled a call within the art world for greater recognition of female artists, both past and present. Research revealed that even though women had regularly contributed to the development of Western art, they were rarely mentioned in its written history. Female art historians began uncovering their legacies and expanding the canon to include their stories. In 1971, feminist art historian Linda Noeklin published her essay, Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists? And this is what you'll read for your final reading response. Um, but her essay credits the lack of women in art history as systemic within a patriarchal society. Noeklin argued that women could never be described as great because the standard of greatness was defined by a canon that favored men. She points out that Throughout history, women have been denied access to art education and opportunities that were readily available for men, effectively making competition on equal terms impossible. For women to be acknowledged as great artists, the conditions of the canon and the art system had to be changed. And this is exactly what the feminist artists of the 1970s and onward were seeking to do. Um, feminist artists used a variety of art forms, often experimental art forms like conceptual and performance art, to try and escape the male-dominated traditional art forms like painting and sculpture, in which women commonly appeared as passive objects of sexual desire created by and for men. Many were interested in essentialist ideas of feminism that defined female experience in terms of the biological difference between women and men. They created imagery based on female anatomy, explored taboo topics like menstruation and reproduction, and used their own bodies as both subject and medium. Many examined traditional female gender roles and explored craft and decorative arts that were historically employed by women as sources of female empowerment. All in all, feminist art seeks to critique the social, political, and art historical frameworks that maintain the systematic oppression of women. 
Now, two prominent feminist artists that we're going to talk about um, from the 1970s were Judy Chicago and Miriam Shapiro. Um, so here I've included um, an earlier drawing by Judy Chicago, who was actually born as Judy Garowitz, um, and she adopted the name of her birth city to free herself from what she called, quote, all names imposed upon her through male societal dominance. Her early work is rather minimalist, with a heavy emphasis on the perfection of surface through the erasure of the artist's hand and a mastery of materials. In 1960s, uh, she started making abstracted images based on female genitalia, like this here. Um, and she called these core female images or imagery. But she wanted to emphasize sexual difference, to challenge the male-dominated art world, and to assert the value of the female experience. In 1970, Judy Chicago moved to California, where she established a feminist studio art course at Fresno State College. And the following year, she moved to L.A. to join Canadian-born painter Miriam Shapiro in establishing the first feminist art program at Cal Arts. In 1971 and 72, Chicago, Shapiro, and 21 female students created Woman House, a collaborative art environment in an empty Hollywood mansion that they renovated and filled with feminist installations and performances. Woman House explored the relationship between biology and social roles, representing women in conventional roles within their homes while challenging the meaning of these spaces and activities in relation to women's self-image. As Miriam Shapiro recalled in 1987, quote, our purpose was to remake the old house into a place of dreams and fantasies. Each room would be transformed into a non-functioning art environment, end quote. Art historian Timma Balducci writes, quote, the artists who produced Woman House used parody and exaggeration as tools to undermine essentialist stereotypes about women that limited them to domestic roles, making it one of the earliest feminist artworks to question the boundaries between essential and constructed meaning. So viewers would wind their way through this home, confronted and challenged by parodies of social expectations. In Shoe Closet by Beth Bockenheimer, for instance, viewers encountered a closet packed with painted high heel shoes, um, suggesting the transformation of woman from subject to object as a housewife who must continually change her costume and mask for her husband's pleasure. In Nutrient Kitchen, or excuse me, Nurturant Kitchen by Suzanne Frazier, Vicki Hodgetts, and Robin Welsh, the colored lighting created a pink aura that bathed the kitchen space. Resembling a factory assembly line, plates of food were lined up under the light bulbs to suggest the dehumanizing of women's role as nurturer. The ceiling and walls were covered with sculptured fried eggs that gradually transform into breasts as they come down the walls. And then aprons were covered with female body parts that could be physically removed when done with housework, indicating that a woman's body is inextricably connected to her societal role. Visitors encountered Faith Wilding's womb room, which consisted of crochet webs that draped the room from floor to ceiling. Meanwhile, Sandra Ogle, excuse me, Sandra Orgel built a female mannequin into a linen closet, her body oppressively interrupted at the neck, chest, and torso by shelves, and in Judy Chicago's installation menstruation bathroom, a trash bin overflowed with bloody pads, drenched Kotex liners hung from a clothesline, and used tampons were strewn about, among other shock-inducing menstrual accoutrements. The mansion would eventually be demolished, but for a short window of time, these women converted its 17 rooms into a showcase for their installations, sculptures, textiles, and performances. But it was also a place where they could engage in probing group sessions about femininity, domesticity, patriarchy, oppression, and more through artworks that juxtaposed ideas of beauty, comfort, and safety associated with the home with the terrors of domestic confinement, oppression, and abuse. Woman House was revolutionary in that it was the first widely experienced survey of feminist art during a time when women were largely disregarded by museums and mainstream art institutions. 
So for Woman House, Miriam Shapiro, in collaboration with another artist, Sherry Brody, contributed Dollhouse, an elaborate mixed media construction of several miniature rooms adorned with richly patterned fabrics, um, essentially creating this home within a home. Shapiro then went on to create a type of work that incorporated pieces of fabric with acrylic paintings. She called these femage, from female and collage. Her 1974 personal appearance number three is characteristic of her femage works because it celebrates traditional women's crafts with a formal and emotional richness that was really meant to counter the male-dominated minimalist aesthetic that was so popular at the time. Shapiro later became a prominent leader in the pattern and decoration movement, a New York-based group of artists who merged the aesthetics of abstraction with decorative motifs derived from women's craft arts, folk art, and art beyond the Western tradition. After her experiences with Shapiro and Woman House, Judy Chicago went on to create The Dinner Party, a huge mixed media installation dedicated to rescuing hundreds of women and female artists from anonymity. It took five years to complete, with Chicago again working collaboratively with some 400 other artists and volunteers. The dinner party consists of three large tables, each 48 feet long, arranged in an equilateral triangle, which is a long-standing symbol of fairness and equality, but also an ancient symbol for women and mother goddesses. The tables are set with a total of 39 place settings, each representing different women of historical, mythical, or legendary significance. Each of the three individual tables contains 13 place settings each, 13 being the number of men present at the Last Supper, as well as the number of witches required to form an official coven. The tables of the dinner party sit on a white porcelain tiled floor that displays the names of an additional 999 significant women in gold script. Each of the 39 place settings of the dinner party includes a 14-inch porcelain plate decorated with Chicago's core female imagery. So these are abstracted forms which are evocative of female genitalia. However, they're also powerful symbols of how femininity is often both revered and feared. Chicago also relates these forms to butterflies, symbolizing freedom or liberation. The porcelain plates were decorated in the tradition of China painting, which had been an acceptable creative hobby for women in the 18th and 19th centuries. Women ordered blank glazed porcelain objects from manufacturers and decorated them, and by the 1890s, more than 25,000 American women engaged in China painting. These women were labeled as amateur artists or lady amateurs, which reinforced the historical hierarchy of arts that was already in place. The stereotype was furthered by arguments that China painting was particularly adapted for the female mind and hand because of traditional subject matter including flowers, animals, and simple patterns. Additionally, China painting also required a certain neatness and patience, two virtues which women were expected to embody. The imagery and ideas of each plate also extend onto the handmade fabric placemats, which are embroidered with the name of a famous historical or mythological woman. Chicago and her partners used fabrics, patterns, stitching, and techniques that were appropriate to the period from which the represented woman was from. Um, so for an example, we have the Emily Dickinson setting here. Um, the plate impresses a sort of decorative feminine and somewhat kitschy tone with its finely carved lace pattern, the sort of folded fabric in the center, and the soft fleshy colors. And then the placemat features intricate floral embroidery and delicate lace. Um, so here's another example. This is the place setting of the Neolithic Fertile Goddess. For this place setting, Chicago wanted to use historically accurate techniques, including hand-spun wool, to weave the fabric that was then decorated with wool coils, fringe, and stitchwork. Some of the collaborators learned to hand-spin wool using a drop spindle, which was one of the first tools invented by women, and likely how Neolithic women would have transformed wool into to um, weavable yarn. 
Um, other workers used hand looms to weave this hand spun wool into pieces that were stitched onto the linen runner. Another artist stewed and cleaned the femur of a cow to create bone needles, which the team used to stitch the final runner and then attached as decoration, along with a small female figurine that mimics the hundreds, if not thousands, of prehistoric female figurines that have been discovered throughout Europe. So in the dinner party, Chicago and her collaborators used traditionally female arts such as ceramics, china painting, and embroidery to ultimately elevate women, their experiences, histories, and materials to a new level of recognition. Chicago used her platform as a professional artist to elevate media that has traditionally been disregarded throughout art history and to acknowledge the women of the past who used such media. Um, she and the other artists used core female imagery to reclaim the female body from the male gaze to allow women to look at their own bodies with a sense of control, ownership, and empowerment. The dinner party embodied the spirit of the 1970s feminist movement and provided a stage for traditional women's crafts to be elevated into the world of fine art, allowing women to learn about and celebrate their heritage and culture as well as their bodies and themselves. Many feminist artists embraced performance art as a powerful tool to challenge the traditional objectification of women's bodies and to explore gender roles in both art and reality. Some, like Martha Rosler, also embraced the new art form of video art, which became popular after portable video cameras were introduced in the U.S. in 1967. Rossler's Semiotics of the Kitchen from 1975 is a pioneering feminist work shot from a single angle camera. Rossler, wearing an apron, performs a parody of TV cooking shows which were popular in the late 1960s. In the film, she names kitchen objects in alphabetical order, such as chopper, dish, egg beater, in a deadpan tone, using aggressive motions to imply her frustrations about the confinement of women to domestic space. Her character transgresses the confined space of the kitchen set and shifts focus to the viewer, stabbing with tools toward the camera and appearing to fling food forward. Rossler famously stated, quote, when the woman speaks, she names her own oppression. And that's exactly what she seems to be doing here in this video. So although women contributed significantly to artistic developments in the 1960s and 70s, major museums and galleries continued to grant special status to work by male artists. In 1984, the Museum of Modern Art in New York sponsored a huge exhibition called An International Survey of Contemporary Painting and Sculpture, which claimed to highlight the period's most important artworks. The exhibition included about 169 mostly white artists, only 13 of which were women. Shortly after, in response, a group of feminist artists, curators, critics, historians, etc. in New York formed an activist group called the Guerrilla Girls that would, as they said, quote, function as the conscience of the art world. The group sought to expose gender and racial inequalities in the art world, stand against discrimination, and fight for rights of female artists and artists of color. They adapted tactics of guerrilla warfare, acting covertly to strike at the enemy. Their first campaign was to paste posters on walls throughout New York art districts, citing damning statistics of discrimination within the city's museums and galleries. Group members were anonymous, taking on the names of dead female artists as pseudonyms, um, and they wanted to do this to sort of counter the tendency of the art world to focus on the individual rather than collective accomplishment. To protect their identities during public events and protests, they wore guerrilla masks, um, a play on the word guerrilla that reflects the group's use of humor to disarm critics and promote their message. So they wear guerrilla masks, but the name guerrilla is spelled like guerrilla warfare rather than the animal. Um, 
They produced sharp, witty posters that really drew on advertising strategies. So this is one of their most famous posters, and it appropriates uh, the reclining female nude figure from Aang's Grand Odalisque that we looked at when we were talking about romanticism. Um, but they've given her a gorilla mask of her own. And then the headline, Do Women Have to Be Naked to Get into the Met Museum? So the poster here presents the findings of a survey of the Met's collection, which revealed that less than 5% of the artists in the museum were women, but 85% of the museum's nudes on display were female. Uh, the group repeated this survey in 2005, and they found that the number of women artists had only increased by 3%, um, which they humorously underscored by noting, well, at least there were more naked men. Um, here's another widely known Gorilla Girls poster that delivers a sarcastic but sadly accurate list of the treatment afforded to women artists. The advantages of being a woman artist include things like working without the pressures of success, being reassured that whatever kind of art you make it will be labeled feminine, not having to undergo the embarrassment of being called a genius, and getting your picture in art magazines wearing a gorilla suit. Feminist artists in the late 1970s and 80s continued to explore postmodern issues of power and the need to expose underlying social structures that oppress and marginalize others, often through appropriation. Barbara Kruger appropriates advertising and marketing techniques, as well as commercial imagery, to subvert the messages in mainstream mass media and instigate social change. Her early career as a graphic designer heavily influences her works, which are provocative photo montages that juxtapose um, words and images to challenge expected meanings that we get from our experiences with pop culture and advertising. Kruger has noted, quote, I think there is an accessibility to pictures and words that we have learned to read very fluently through advertising and through the technological development of photography and film and video. So one example of her work is this 1981 untitled Your Gaze Hits the Side of My Face, which presents a cropped and enlarged black and white printed image of a female mannequin framed within an advertising context. Although the pronouns in the text are ambiguous of gender, the prominence of the female mannequin's appearance directly connects Kruger's work to the postmodern theory of the male gaze, which was much discussed in the 70s and 80s, and addresses how most images of women reinforce unequal power relationships between men and women, even if they don't intend to, because women are commonly uh, seen or interpreted as passive, helpless sexual beings for hetero male consumption. The use of a mannequin rather than a real woman is a literal illustration of this objectification. Kruger's wording is also important here. By saying your gaze hits the side of my face rather than the gaze or the face, she's addressing the viewer directly and kind of forcing us to acknowledge the relationship between the viewer and the viewed. In this case, the viewer is sort of directly related to a consumer who looks at an object of desire for purchase. And so we're really being asked to think about our role and responsibility as a viewer and the effects of viewing and objectification on women. Here's another example of her work, this time untitled Your Body is a Battleground from 1989, which uh, Kruger designed for a pro-choice rally in Washington, D.C. to protest a string of anti-abortion laws that undermined the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision. So the background here is a photographic image of a woman's face, uh, presumably taken, again, from... Uh, like mass media advertising, um, but her face is split vertically into symmetrical halves with the positive and negative of the black and white image. Red words are splashed, splashed across the image, your body is a battleground. Kruger says, quote, I think that it's important for me to somehow, through a collection of words and images, uh, try to picture or objectify or visualize how it might feel sometimes to be alive today. Uh, and, and she's thinking specifically about, you know, how it feels as a woman to be alive today. 
Um, and so her works are often both, you know, art and protest, and they are typically sort of tied to a specific moment in time, but the power is timeless and the messages have just as much resonance today as they did then. So another feminist artist, Cindy Sherman, used photography allied with performance to engage in a postmodern critique of society. In the late 1970s, Sherman began her Untitled Film Stills series, in which she cast herself as the star of an ongoing, inexhaustibly inventive series of still photographs that are meant as one-frame movies. Using costumes, makeup, wigs, props, lighting, and settings, Sherman sought to reference and subvert the stereotypical roles played by women in films, television, and commercials of the 1950s and 60s. So although each untitled image stands alone, they come together to represent women's collective stories. She says they're not meant as self-portraits, but rather that she's trying to make other people recognize themselves rather than me. For example, in untitled film still number 21, Sherman created a narrative and assumed the role of a small town girl recently arrived in the big city. The image itself focuses on her face, and something off screen has seemingly caught her attention, but her expression is unsure, and so there's this sort of ominous feeling. Um, others show her in roles such as the hardworking housewife, the femme fatale, the teenage runaway, and you know other stereotypical female archetypes. Um, she does tend to maintain a certain level of ambiguity within the photos, though. For example, number 35 here uh, kind of shows her as a hardworking housewife wearing an apron with her hair wrapped in a scarf. The scuffs on the door and the wall imply the possibility of violence, maybe underscoring the terrors of domestic life, and her serious expression and somewhat sassy pose standing near the door and the coat rack suggests that perhaps the woman has, uh, you know, had enough, she's fed up, and she's leaving, but it's really unclear if that's the case or if instead maybe she's just returned home from running errands or something. Um, really, with these untitled film stills, Sherman is commenting on womanhood and how it oftentimes becomes a performance. By forcing the viewer to acknowledge the illusion of her images, Sherman underscores the power of visual representation to construct female identity and alludes to the performances that we enact in everyday life. Through her masquerading, she's also saying that identity is not necessarily fixed, which is an idea that can be liberating, but it's somewhat ironic because she often takes on these ultra-feminine, vulnerable, or submissive roles. Later, Sherman continued to photograph herself in various costumes, disguises, and roles to examine women's roles not only in film, but in history and contemporary society as well. So, for example, in Untitled Number 193 from 1989, Sherman presents herself as an 18th century French aristocratic woman reclining on a bed of lavish blue silks dressed in this elegant white gown. Uh, to the left, we have this ball of yarn and crochet needles, which are meant to reference the domestic realm. And then to the right side, we have this huge fake foot that pokes out from under her dress, underscoring the sort of fakery of the entire image. Um, again, she's thinking about gender and class as performative and artificial, and as being defined and controlled by social conventions, history, the media, etc. The civil rights movement of the 1960s and 70s sought to address how 100 years post-emancipation proclamation, African Americans were still experiencing discrimination, segregation, disenfranchisement, oppression, and violence. Many African American artists were active during this time, exploring themes of individual and racial identity and difference, seeking to highlight the struggles and experiences of marginalized communities, and to to lay claim to their place within the art world. 
Many Black artists felt called to use their work to protest the violence directed against African Americans and the systemic racial discrimination in America, politicizing their art as a powerful tool for social commentary to advocate for liberation, justice, and equal rights. Born in 1930, Faith Ringgold began her artistic journey as an abstract painter in the 1950s. However, the civil rights and feminist movements of the 60s and 70s profoundly influenced her, steering her towards creating more narrative works which explore civil rights, Jim Crow laws, the assassination of MLK, race riots, black pride and the politics of skin color, women's rights, prison systems, as well as her own personal experiences as a Black woman during this turbulent era. For example, her 1967 work titled The Flag is Bleeding is part of a series of about 20 paintings which depict racial tensions in America at the time. It depicts a Black man, a white woman, and a white man linking arms with an American flag superimposed over the figures. Um, the red stripes of the flag drip down over the figures like blood. The black man holds a knife in one hand and he has his other hand over his heart, um, both mimicking the Pledge of Allegiance as well as covering a stab wound. Um, while he fights for his freedom, his humanity, and ultimately his life, the other figures here are unscathed, living the American dream, completely oblivious to his struggle. Ringgold said, quote, we thought of the American flag as our symbol of freedom, but we were losing freedoms in the 1960s. All the blood laying all over the sidewalk and nothing about it in the papers. I mean, silence like it didn't happen. Uh, then in the 1980s, Ringgold began making story quilts, which combine representational subject matter, written text, acrylic, and African-American quilting traditions to create visual narratives richly layered with meaning. Quilting has long been considered a women's craft, but more specifically, quilts are some of the most important pieces of African-American visual culture. Ringgold's great-grandmother was um, one of many slaves who made quilts for plantation owners in the South using scraps of fabric in patchwork patterns. By incorporating this media and technique, Ringgold addresses these ancestral cultural traditions. Um, this work, Tar Beach of 1988, presents a story from the perspective of eight-year-old Cassie, although the story itself is inspired by Ringgold's own memories of growing up in Harlem. The title Tar Beach refers to the rooftop of the apartment building where Ringgold's family would sleep on hot nights, which she described as a magical place. The central panel, surrounded by a colorful patchwork quilted border, shows Cassie on the roof with her brother while her parents and neighbors play cards. White horizontal panels include a handwritten account of Cassie's dream in which she can fly over the city and claim possession of anything that she flies across. Um, in the dream, she claims George Washington Bridge for herself, a new union-constructed building for her father, who was a factory worker but could not join the union because he was black, and an ice cream factory for her mother. The fantasy is charming, and the image is a rather quaint human scene, void of stereotypes, but it's a reminder for the viewer of the real social and economic limitations and prejudices facing African Americans during this time. Another prominent African American artist, Betty Saar, uses a variety of materials and techniques in her works to confront racial and gender inequalities. She's best known for her multimedia assemblages in shadow box style frames. One of her best known works titled The Liberation of Aunt Jemima, made at the height of the civil rights movement, combines two and three dimensional imagery to challenge the derogatory stereotype of a happy enslaved mammy. The larger three-dimensional figure is actually a notepad holder to which Sar has attached another image of a mammy holding a crying white child. In front of that, she's situated a large black power fist so that it sort of replaces the mammy's skirt. The larger figure holds a broom in one hand and a rifle in the other. Cotton is spread across the ground line while the background um, 
Sar has used repeated images of a smiling Aunt Jemima taken straight from a box of the name brand pancake mix. And by using these appropriated images and objects, Sar sort of subverts and critiques the stereotype, liberating the figure from both white oppression and traditional gender roles, and ultimately transforming her into a woman who demands power, threatening the viewer to accept her identity, dignity, and her commitment to fighting for racial and gender equality. Um, African-American conceptual and performance artist Adrienne Piper often directly confronts racism and racial passing in her works. Piper herself is rather light-skinned, and so throughout her life she's often encountered racist comments from white people who assume that she is also white. Um, in the 1980s, she devised a performance called My Calling Card Number no. 1, Reactive Guerrilla Performance for Dinners and Cocktail Parties, in which she gives out a card to those who make racist remarks in public, really challenging people to take personal responsibility for their behaviors by making them feel a similar level of discomfort as their comment makes Piper and people of color feel. So this particular card reads, Dear friend, I am black. I am sure that you did not realize this when you made slash laughed at slash agreed with that racist remark. In the past, I've attempted to alert white people to my racial identity in advance. Unfortunately, this invariably causes them to react to me as pushy, manipulative, or socially inappropriate. Therefore, my policy is to assume that white people do not make these remarks even when they believe there are no black people present, and to distribute this card when they do. I regret any discomfort my presence is causing you, just as I am sure you regret the discomfort your racism is causing me. So as we saw with T.C. Cannon, several indigenous artists in the second half of the 20th century also embraced postmodernism to celebrate native culture, to advocate for indigenous rights, and to challenge viewers to confront Native American stereotypes. For example, James Luna, born in 1950, was a Paiyakichum, Ipai, and Mexican-American performance and multimedia artist and photographer who is known for his works that challenge the ways in which conventional museum exhibitions depict Native Americans. One of his best known works is titled The Artifact Piece. Um, this was first performed in 1987 at the Museum of Man in San Diego, which is an ethnographic museum rather than an art museum. In this work, Luna challenges viewers to confront Native American stereotypes by turning his living body into an ethnographic object for people to observe. He lays almost naked in a display case filled with sand and other artifacts from his life, including his favorite music, books, and personal papers. Museum-style labels point to marks and scars on his body, inviting viewers to ogle and objectify him, and in doing so, to confront their own prejudices. Luna's work critiques the role of institutions in perpetuating stereotypes and challenges the viewer to rethink their perceptions of Native Americans. Artist, curator, educator, and activist Jeanne Quick to See Smith is of French Cree and Shoshone descent and an enrolled member of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes raised on the Flathead Indian Nation Reservation in Montana. She takes on a lot of issues in her artworks, including tribal and community affiliations, racial stereotypes, um, the environment, mass media, consumerism, and more. Her subject matter pulls from her native identity to address the myths of her ancestors in the context of current issues that face Native Americans. Smith's artworks share her view of the world, offering her personal perspective as an artist, a Native American, and a woman. Her works create a dialogue between the art and its viewer and explore issues of Native identity as seen by both Native Americans and non-Native viewers. In response to the 500th anniversary of Christopher Columbus's landing and the beginning of the mistreatment of Native Americans, in 1992, Smith created Trade, Gifts for Trading Land with White People, a large mixed media work that illustrates historical and contemporary inequities between Native Americans and the United States government. 
The work references the role of trade goods in allegorical stories, like that of the acquisition of the island of Manhattan by Dutch colonists in 1626 from unnamed Native Americans in exchange for goods worth about 60 guilders or roughly $24. Though more apocryphal than true, this story has become part of American folklore, suggesting that Native Americans had been lured off their land by inexpensive trade goods. The fundamental misunderstanding between the Native and non-Native worlds, especially the notion of private ownership of land, really underlies this work. Smith stated that if this work could speak, it might say, quote, Why won't you consider trading the land we handed over to you for these silly trinkets that so honor us? Sound like a bad deal? Well, that's the deal you gave us. The work layers um, paint images and objects, uh, suggesting layers of history and complexity. The canvas surface is collaged with newspaper articles about native life, along with photos, comics, tobacco and gum wrappers, advertisements, etc., all featuring stereotypical depictions of Native Americans, mixed with photographs of deer, buffalo, and native men in historic dress holding pipes with feathers in their hair. On the final layer, Smith painted a ghostly outline of an almost life-size canoe. Canoes were used by Native Americans as well as non-Native explorers and traders in the 18th, 19th, and even early 20th centuries to travel the waterways of North America. The canoe suggests the possibility of trade and cultural connections, though this empty canoe is stuck, unable to move. Above the canvas, Smith strung a clothesline from which she has dangled a variety of native-themed toys and souvenirs, especially from sports teams with Native American mascots. The items include toy tomahawks, a child's headdress with brightly dyed feathers, red man chewing tobacco, a Washington Redskins cap and license plate, a Florida State Seminoles bumper sticker, a Cleveland Indian pennant and cap, and Atlanta Braves license plate, a beaded belt, a toy quiver with an arrow, and a plastic Indian doll. Smith offers these cheap goods in exchange for the lands that were lost, reversing the historic sale of land for trinkets. These items also serve as reminders of how native life and culture has been commodified, um, transforming these native cultural objects into cheap items sold without a true understanding of what the original meanings were. Other works by Quick to See Smith include Indian Madonna Enthroned from 1974, a three-dimensional assemblage that consists of materials such as dried corn, pheasant wings, and beaded hide moccasins, ultimately creating the figure of a native woman sitting on a wooden chair, clutching a book titled God is Red, with an American flag draped across her lap. This work has multiple messages. With it, Smith critiques the patriarchal organization of imported Christianity, with the United States flag as a lap blanket and the leather strap across the figure's back marked property of BIA, referencing the Bureau of Indian Affairs, she also critiques the genocidal U.S. ideology of settler colonialism. The Madonna's most striking aspect is her own face and that of the child carried on her back, each an ink and graphite drawing on paper with a gilded frame. Smith seems to say, we are not exhibits in a natural history museum. We are alive, we are here, we are creating things. And with this work, she's sort of creating this declaration of native survival. Another work from 1995 titled Spam consists of the charcoal contour of a bison stretched across a canvas over which Smith has layered newspaper clippings and semi-transparent paint. The bison was once a primary food source for many indigenous peoples across North America, but the introduction of bovine diseases and intentional overhunting by invading settlers brought the species to the brink of extinction.
The transformation of foodways was further exacerbated by the U.S. government's seizure of hunting grounds and the forced relocation of many tribes. As a result, canned and processed goods such as spam eventually became staples on reservations. Co-opting the style and slogans of food advertising, Smith's spam suggests the detrimental health effects that accompanied the loss of nutrient-rich traditional foods. So building on the models of asserting identity set by the feminist and civil rights artists and fueled by the emotion and urgency brought on by the AIDS crisis, many artists in the late 20th century embraced postmodernism to explore the topic of gender more broadly and to consider its relationship to sexual identity and orientation. For example, Robert Mapplethorpe, an American photographer, explored identity, gender and sexuality and mortality through his carefully composed, elegantly lit, and technically perfect photographs. He's perhaps best known for his controversial graphic depictions of homoerotic or S&M-based imagery, and his fascination with black nude male bodies, as well as his self-portraits, which explore gender binaries and paradoxes. His 1980 self-portrait number 385 is a striking example of his work. In this photograph, Mablethorpe plays with different aspects of his identity, curling his hair and wearing makeup, challenging conventional ideas of gender and sexuality. His work raises questions about the assumptions people make on appearance, um, emphasizing that gender is a construct and that not everyone fits into the conventional binary. Mapplethorpe's work became even more poignant as he faced his own mortality, dying in the late 1980s from an AIDS-related illness. Somewhat similarly, Catherine Opie, born in 1961, uses photography to investigate the nuances of gender and identity. In her earlier series titled Being and Having from the early 1990s, Opie depicted her friends in the lesbian and gay community in Los Angeles, blending traditional portrait photography with less traditional subjects. Her later domestic series involved traveling across the United States to photograph lesbian couples in their everyday settings. In these works, Opie focuses on the bond and relationship between the couples rather than their appearance or their gender identity. Overall, her portraits introduce viewers to new ways of life and challenge them to reconsider familiar people and things in new ways. Uh, so in 1981, the first reports of a mysterious disease that was disproportionately affecting gay men began to emerge. Named AIDS, Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome in 1983, the disease is caused by HIV, a blood-borne sexually transmitted virus that can live for years in the carrier's body and be unknowingly passed regardless of gender or sexual orientation. By the mid-1980s, AIDS had been declared a global pandemic, and by 1994, it was the leading cause of death among all Americans between the ages of 25 and 44. Throughout the 1980s, misinformation and paranoia amongst the general public, in addition to the disproportionate impact of AIDS on the gay community and pre-existing stigmas, led to a general disregard of its seriousness. The rapid spread and devastating physical effects of the disease resulted in the loss of thousands of lives, many in their prime. Many artists adapted activist strategies to educate the public and call for action, while others were inspired by personal suffering and loss to create works that confront human emotions like grief, anger, love, and hope. The political group ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, formed in New York in 1987 to combat inaction and misinformation. Artists and art collectives, including the collective Grand Fury, produced numerous artists' vehicles for ACT UP, illustrating the group's slogan, Silence Equals Death. The pink triangle that accompanies the slogan in this neon version by Grand Fury was based on pink triangles used by Nazi concentration camps to identify gay men in a bold reclamation of the symbol as one for gay rights rather than shame or, you know, othering. 
The neon version that you see here was first installed in the window of the new museum in New York when ACT UP was first founded, but it has also appeared in several different contexts since. The underlying message is that a group needs to articulate a visible identity and a message in order to overcome exclusion. The AIDS Memorial Quilt is an ongoing effort to address loss and political issues caused by the AIDS epidemic. Historically, quilts serve a community purpose, often made collectively to mark different life events like marriages or births and to preserve cultural history and beliefs. The AIDS Memorial Quilt grew out of a gay community in San Francisco, begun in the 1980s by a gay rights activist named Clive Jones. Um, he built on these you know, quilting traditions to educate the public and create a lasting memorial for the hundreds of people who lost their lives. Uh, so here's a, kind of a detailed view of the AIDS Memorial Quilt. Each three by six foot panel is sewn by friends, families, and lovers uh, to commemorate lost individuals. The panels are then organized into 12 by 12 foot blocks that can be exhibited individually or collectively. In 1987, an exhibition of the quilt on the National Mall in DC included 1,920 blocks to visually demonstrate the scale of the epidemic and incite government action towards research, education, and prevention. Today, the AIDS Memorial Quilt includes more than about 50,000 panels in remembrance of more than 110,000 individuals, and it's still growing. Other artists were more inspired by personal suffering and loss, and they created works that confront human emotions like anger, grief, love, and hope more directly. Felix Gonzalez Torres demonstrates a minimalist interest in sparsity, geometry, repetition, and mass production, combined with deeply personal meaning in works that offer profound statements on human mortality and loss. In 1990, the artist's longtime partner, Ross Laycock, was dying of AIDS. Gonzalez Torres's untitled lover boy on the left here consists of a stack of blue um, excuse me, pale blue papers that were, you know, stacked on the gallery floor with instructions for visitors to take a sheet with them as they pass through. As they do this, the stack diminishes in height um, and serves as an allegory for the slow disappearance of Ross's body as the disease progresses. Similarly, um, the work on the right, untitled Portrait of Ross in L.A. from 1991, consisted of a 175-pound pile of individually wrapped candies, again with instructions for viewers to take a piece of candy from the pile as they move through the space. The starting weight of 175 pounds equals Ross's ideal healthy weight, and again the act of removing candies diminishes the pile, mimicking how Ross's body was slowly deteriorating due to his disease. Involving the viewers realizes the meaning of the work, and it sends them away with a small reminder of its purpose and it transforms a story of personal or individual loss into a more universal political act that really, uh, sorry, that really called attention to the social impact of the AIDS crisis, and it sort of serves as a memorial, again, for those who were lost.